Good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode seven of my podcast slash webcast, Fall to Rise. I actually can't believe that we made it seven episodes. To be honest with you, I didn't think that we'd make it past one. But uh, today is a very special episode and a very important topic. Tonight's topic is daddy issues. Now, normally when we hear daddy issues, we often hear about how it affects women. We don't normally think about how daddy issues can affect men. My view of, or definition of what a daddy issue is, is when your father is not there either physically or emotionally, and the way that they raised you or didn't raise you affects you to this day. I have two guests on here tonight, actually three guests, but two guests that have been affected uh, by daddy issues. And we're going to get into the effects that it's had on their lives. My first guest is now a regular on the show, uh, Mr. Derek Cooper. Derek, how are you, sir? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for coming on again. Of course, of course. Now, when we first talked about this, uh, you told me that you had some pretty, pretty bad daddy issues, and you said that it can get dark. It gets, I was really, I'll just let everybody know, I was really, like, hesitant to even bring up my conversation in the group because I was like, this is going to be a real dark conversation. I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. And I, yeah, so I was like real cautious, but you know, me and you talked heavily and you're like, you know what? I came to the conclusion that yeah, I'll tell my story. Yeah. Now, full disclosure, uh, this episode may get a little passionate. So if, uh, the language, if the language gets a little blue, it's because of the passion of the people that are on this show. So, uh, Let's jump into it. All right. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. Okay. Derek, what types of daddy issues do you think that you have? Oh, God. Um, well, my father was never there. I'll put that out there. Uh, never there mentally, emotionally, physically, every once in a while. Um, my father always lived five minutes down the road from me, but I saw him maybe once every seven years. And whenever he wow. saw me, he would ask me for money. Wow. My father's been on drugs so what do you want me to do? altogether probably 40 years. Oh, wow. For, I'm sorry, you said your father's been on drugs oh, for yeah. 40 years? Yeah, probably wow. about 40 years altogether. Wow. Um, I think it's a mixture between coke, prim primarily coke, coke and boat, coke which is boat? the mix between uh, formaldehyde and weed. I forget where everybody, everybody has a different word for it, wherever mm -hmm. they are, but down from where I'm from, it's called boat. And okay. So he's been on that stuff for many, many, many years. So I never ever had a connection with him. Okay. But um, it's definitely left his mark on me. Like I think I talked about in the second episode, I had a strong, I didn't trust a lot of people, especially I didn't trust a lot of black men because I remember he's my first example of what a black man should be. Yes. If he's trash, then I'm like, I'm just not even going to deal with y'all, period. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I came into my own, but at that time as a kid, I knew that I, could, I never wanted to be like him and never want to be associated with him. Mm -hmm. um, and we just had, I've always had issues with that guy. And then in my older years, I've started to understand why he is the way he is, because okay. uh, you want me to talk about it now? Or Go ahead. Way? Oh, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I told All you, right. to, I, want you to, I want this to be as natural as possible for you. I want you to just completely flow okay. with everything cool because deal, cool your deal. story might help someone tonight sure. or someone may be going through what you went through. Sure. So be as open and honest as you want. Absolutely. All right. So uh, becoming an adult, like I said, I never still, still didn't have a relationship with my father. Uh, so flashback to 2015, I'm finishing up. Uh, semester of college. I think I was finishing up chemistry. I just got done with the chemistry final, so I just got home and I'm chilling, sleeping. So he calls me. My father mm -hmm. calls me. He never calls me, so I was like, "Yo, what's going on? Is everything okay?" Uh, he's drugged out of his mind, completely drugged out. Guy, I'm pretty sure he was on some new stuff, but he can barely even speak, barely coherent. Um, he just kept mumbling, but then I heard him say some stuff that. <laughs> really made me uncomfortable like got my heart pounding now um just gonna be blunt with it my father propositioned me 
And by proposition, what do you mean? Let your mind go. I mean, he basically propositioned uh, oral sex for me. Your father? Yeah. So to this day, that shit shook, shook me to my core. Because mm -hmm. I never in a million years would have thought anything like that would have even happened. Like, granted, I don't have a relationship with you, relationship with you mm -hmm. but I'm still your son. Yeah. And so then he called me like, a couple of days later saying, I apologize. I was on that stuff. I don't know why I even say that stuff, this and that. Mm -hmm. But then like six months later, the same thing happens. He propositions you again? Yeah. And then he goes more into detail about it. Um, he starts to talk about his life growing up mm -hmm. and how he was traumatized as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, his brother actually abused him. He was a kid. And so I understood him from that sense why his mind is so damaged and why he always chose drugs. But yeah, that, that was probably one of that, that shook me to my core. So, so ever since then, I never even gave him a chance. Like I, I understand you're going through life and you're going through your own pain, mm -hmm. but I can't be a part of it. I don't want to be part of your healing or your struggle. I don't want to be, I, I just can't be a part of that. So I had to excommunicate him. Well, being that your dad, uh, well, first of all, let's start with the drinking and the drugs first. Let's, let's tackle that. Yeah. Had you ever seen him drunk or use drugs? My mom divorced him when I was four. So, okay. yeah. But it was the, the drugs, the alcohol. He was also extremely abusive. Apparently, him and my mom would have brawls. Mm -hmm. And this is before I was born. But oh, wow. apparently, he was a monster. Mm -hmm. Whenever I talk to my sister, she's like, I never want to see that man. If he dies, God is good. Hmm. So, yeah. Well, how do you think that, that affects you to this day, just seeing that, or knowing that that happens? Uh, the main way it affected me is that I don't really drink, and I don't, I think the only drug, if you can call it a drug, is weed. I've done weed every once in a while, but I don't recall a drug. Um, but the main thing for me is alcohol. I do not drink much alcohol. If I do, it's like a drop of whiskey every once in six months. Like, I don't, yeah, I just, I made a conscious decision not to be like him. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, when I have kids, I don't want them around my kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really protective of like, even my niece and nephew. I'm always protective of like, if there's people there around them, I want to make sure they're safe. Mm -hmm. um, also, there was a point in time where I didn't think I wanted kids mm -hmm. because I was scared that though I'm nothing like him, but I'm like, what if I become a, a guy like that, become a yeah. straight alcoholic, and I might abuse my kids or touch my kids, even though I'm not that type of person. It's mm -hmm. like that thought in the back of your head is just still there, just lingering, like, am I going to, am I going to turn, turn out to be him? Yeah, it's still there, still in you. Yeah, and it scares the shit out of me still. Even though I know I'm never going to do that, it's still there. It is still mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of your father propositioning you, do you think that that has something to do with the fact that you're gay? Probably. I think for him, it was like a gateway for him to be like, okay, maybe, I, maybe he'll be into it because he's gay. Because mm -hmm. sadly, there's a lot of people that have this weird thought process that if you are uh, gay or lesbian and so on and so forth, you're mm -hmm. automatically a freak and you're mm -hmm. going to be open to anything, which of course is completely not true. Mm -hmm. But like right now, I'm still swag that it freaked me out. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, so I feel like that was his gateway. And then he told me that he was bisexual. It, oh, wow. it was a lot. It was a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that you needed a dad to look to talk to or look up to growing up. Yeah, thankfully I have my uncles, but no. Nah, okay. Like if, when I, while I was growing up, I guess mm -hmm. I knew that he was never an option. Oh, wow. Like I automatically just knew like, okay, he is not going to be an option at all to be a father. So I don't even need to look at him. If anything, call him by his first name. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, do you, do you think that your relationship with your father affects you in relationships uh, today? Uh, I would say, yeah, only because I'm really cautious. I'm, I pay attention. And basically, I'm testing you out, or I'm trying to see, like, are you going to mess up? Or are you going to find out, am I going to find out you're an addict or something like that? Because if so, that's immediate grounds for dismissal for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm really cautious. I'm hesitant when getting into a relationship just because I'm just, yeah.
was cautious. I can imagine. Yeah. Do you think that maybe your dad was the way that he was with you because of the trauma that he experienced as a child? I believe so. At the time when it happened, of course I didn't. I was like, this of course. is crazy. But <laughs> um, as the older I've gotten and the wiser I've gotten, the more I realized, like, nah, he was traumatized as a kid, too. He passed and, that trauma on to you. Yeah. He, it was, he told me some graphic details that happened to him. I'm just, and this is when he was high. But I was just like, I felt bad for him because I'm like, man, mm-hmm. you didn't have a chance. Yeah. So, he so wanted to pass that from on that to sense. You. Yeah. He wanted to pass that pain on to you. Yeah. Thankfully, not to the full extent, but mm-hmm. I did get some of the effects from it. But um, at the end of the day, I wish him nothing but peace of mind. Um, I'm probably never going to speak to him again, and that's just my choice. But I do, w- I do wish him peace. Is have you forgiven him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely forgiven him. I don't hate him. Um, the crazy thing is, I've never hated him. Mm-hmm. I just knew that he was never an option when I was a kid, and when I get older, I'm just like, man, he's damaged. Mm-hmm. He's damaged, and yes, he's made his own decisions as an adult that got him to the place he's at today, but his foundation, his foundation was so broken. It was so flawed. Like he didn't have a chance. And so I mm-hmm. understand it from that sense. So I can't be mad at somebody who didn't have a chance from the beginning, from the beginning. Now in situations like this, whenever parents, especially a father acts a certain way to a child, the child often blames themselves. Were you ever in that situation in life? No, no, I always, yourself? For me, I was always like, nah, he made this decision. He okay. chose to be a piece of shit. So <laughs> I get that's it. that on that. That's what was my thought process was. As a kid. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you cope uh, with the absentee father? With your father not being there physically or emotionally? Uh, so when I was a kid, I was a loner. But the people who, who I did open up to was probably my uncle that lived right next door. He mm-hmm. was the best substitute father in the world. I mean... That was everything. He taught me how to fix cars, this and that. I mean, he was my father figure growing up. Mm-hmm. So I'm so you thankful got, I had him. You got lucky. I mean, there's a lot of oh, men yeah. that don't have that. There's a lot of men that, you know, they don't necessarily have those fathers in their lives. And you can see it come out in different ways. In yeah. certain ways, they're more aggressive than they should be. In other ways, they may not be able to hold a relationship. Yeah. Uh, they may not be able to balance their emotions, unfortunately. And th- these are all things that I've seen. Mm-hmm. You know, in a weird situation, like my, my dad was a great father, but he didn't have his father growing up yeah. because his father passed away when he was 10. So my father, in a sense, kind of overcompensated. You know, his dad wasn't the type that would say, hey, let's go out to a ball game. Right. Hey, let's go out and go play basketball. So with me, my dad always, instead of taking care of himself and getting sleep, because when I was younger, he worked two jobs. Yeah. He said, hey, let's, let's go play baseball. Let's go play basketball. Let's go to an event. And I think that he was trying to overcompensate for not having his own father in his life. Right. Now, I happen to be one of the lucky ones. But there's a lot of people out here that unfortunately don't have that. Mm -hmm. And they start yearning for that father figure. And those people, they tend to join gangs. They tend to be very promiscuous. They tend to use drugs. That's true. And you're lucky because you, even though you had it rough growing up, you had the strength to not do that, to not do any of those things. That's true. You become a good, young, successful young man. I can call you a young man because you're a couple years younger. Who grandfather are you, but okay. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I'm I'm four years older than you. I'm your elder. Eh, (laughs) (laughs) For those that don't know, Derek and I, uh, we were co-workers for a very long time. Yeah, we were. So we uh, we often joke with each other this way. So we've had these types of conversations uh, with each other. What if, uh, well, My final question for you is what advice would you give to someone that is going through what you went through or has those types of daddy issues? Okay. So the best thing I could say is your father is damaged. Okay. He's gone through a lot in his life. However, that doesn't justify him committing the same actions as an adult. Mm. And you have to think about yourself before you think about your father. Sadly, you have to be selfish. Yeah. It's okay to, like I said last week, it's okay to put your sanity before somebody. Yeah. So if you have to push somebody at a distance, that's okay. 
You can love somebody from a distance. You can wish them well from a distance. But just accept, you just got to understand the fact that they are broken or they're going through their own journey in life. That's not a clean journey. The path mm -hmm. is broken, but yeah. That's the best I can say. <laughs> the best you can. <laughs> well, well, thank you. We're, we're going to be coming back to you before the end of this episode. Trust me. Okay. We're definitely going to be coming back to you. Uh, oh, yeah. My next guest is Damien. Uh, I've known Damien for quite a while. And when I told Damien about this episode, he presented an interesting dynamic. He's in the situation where he has the daddy issues with his children which is the flip side that most people don't talk about. Most people are angry at the fathers, but they may not understand why there's this rift between the father and the children. So he's actually going to present the other side. Uh, welcome to the show, Damien. Your audio's off. Hang on, your, your audio's off. Hang on, I'll take care of you. All right. Right, can you hear me now? I can hear you. All right. Thanks no, for coming on, Dan. All right, my no problem. Um, anytime, brother. Um, basically, my situation is I have four kids. Uh, I was married once to my two oldest kids, and basically, everything was cool uh, until I served the mother with the divorce papers. Once that happened. She turned off the whole cordial being friends thing and just went totally left and started, how can I put it, injecting venom into my daughter, my oldest daughter. Um, as far as my oldest son, he was always trying to basically look at it as I have to live with my mom too, so I can't take sides. So I understood that. Um, but as they got older, I started taking my submit from being a weekend dad to every other week dad. Basically, got to a point where my daughter was 17. She told me she didn't need me no more. And basically said, take care of the other three kids. I don't need you, anything. So I said, fine, if you feel that way, you want to be treated like an adult, I'll step back and treat you like an adult. I uh, kept my, switched everything from being a weekend dad to every two, for two weeks dad with my son and my other two kids. And basically, uh, it was working out until recently, my, both my older kids moved down to North Carolina with their mom. So now, as she has done for the past couple of years, has just basically put venom across the board to our mutual friends or to our kids in which they look at it like, okay, well, he's not doing anything as a dad, but as James has seen and all my friends see, I always have my kids with me. I've always done something. If you are, if you, if I wasn't sitting by myself, I have my sons or my youngest daughter or anybody, any of them with me. And James can vouch for that because he's called me on plenty of times also. Yeah. So, I mean, I've looked at it as part of a bitterness that she has towards me. Um, she's currently remarried, but still holds that bitterness towards me in which she says I wasn't doing anything for the kids in which I pay child support and go above and beyond. So it's just like now, when my daughter turns 20, I have to treat her like as an adult, as I told her when she graduated high school, and now the venom is coming more into my oldest son. Now my other two kids, their moms, I don't have a problem with. We're cool, cordial, we see each other, we talk to each other, and we keep it strictly for the kids, co-parents. But as for my two oldest, that's where my dynamic for, my, for where I come from and my background, because I tried to open conversation with them as far as my father wasn't there, but I was blessed to have a stepdad that stepped up. Now, with being that your father wasn't there, uh, did you go through the same thing uh, with you being poisoned about your birth father? My mom tried it, but like I said, my stepdad has been with me since I was two months old. Oh, wow. Okay. And then, like, my mom got, got to a point where she was bad mouthing my, my father. My stepdad was like, no, don't do that. Let him find out for himself. Mm -hmm. And I found that out when I was 13. So I was just like, wow. you know, from the time I was a kid all the way up, I knew my father was there. And kind of find out, you pop up every four years to check on Check on wow. my siblings. So and then what made it real bad it was that to me, when I started realizing it was like my grandmother, his mother was doing all his job, and he wasn't there to do it. 
So when it came down to it, it was like my mom would start trying to, but my stepdad would step in like, no, you can't say nothing bad about his father. Let him find out on his own. So when I found out on his own, I found out on my own, I basically told him, I was like, I don't need you. I'm like, I'm 13, mm-hmm. I'm doing what I need to do. I was like, how does it feel to have your mother and your stepfather take care of your kids? And we didn't really speak for a good six years after that. Now, when you, I know you, when you said that you told your dad that you didn't need him. Do you, how can I put this? Do you feel that that hurt him when you said that? It hurt him, but to me, I knew that if I knew, I knew personally that he didn't care. Okay. He was living his life. He was out doing whatever he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, he was a, he was a, he was a man about town, a way to his life. Mm-hmm. So it was like basically I already knew, you know, where he stood and how he stood about me and my siblings. But as far as anything else, it was just like, all right. I can't even talk to you or call you. I got my, my stepdad, I got my grandfather, my uncles, and my aunts, I'm good. Now, when your daughter said to you that she didn't need you, did that harken back to that 13-year-old you that said that to your father? Did you start to get those feelings again? Honestly, no. It, it, it got, I got the feeling when she said it to me, I looked at her and I said, that's not the person, the kid that I know. Mm-hmm. I was like, somebody's in her ear constantly. I was like, because... Four years ago, it was daddy this, daddy that, daddy, daddy, daddy. And like, all of a sudden, you're mad because I'm working. You think I'm not trying to spend time with you, but you're in high school. You're doing your own thing. I'm trying to give you your space and trying to teach you how the world works. But you want to daddy, daddy, daddy. And I'm like, we can't, certain things we can't do. But I was like, I always made sure that I was always there. Okay. Now, do you so think when, that you... When she, said, when she said it to me, I was like, if you feel that you're mature enough to say that to me, that I'm going to treat you as a mature person, I'll still get that. Okay. And then if you don't speak to me, I can't force you to speak to me. You got your own choice. But you after will- she graduated, we spoke, and she wanted me at her graduation at her prom. So mm-hmm. I didn't start working out. But then she, after she graduated, she went back to being independent again. Are you afraid or nervous for your children being that you're not in their life as much as you want to be? I'm always afraid of nervous for my kids. Uh, you know, I was, it's parental paranoia. It's, mm-hmm. it's, once you're a parent, you're, you're constantly worried. No matter if they're not with you or they're with you, you're constantly worried. Like, are they eating right? Are they sleeping right? Are they wearing the right clothes? Are they doing whatever? So, mm-hmm. I mean, they're not with me now, but I know for a fact, like right now, I know that my daughter, I've taught my daughter enough to survive. I've taught my son enough you know, just to make sure you know what to do in case of emergencies and stuff like that. Okay. So now, with I made sure, sure I instilled that in them before they even left my side. So, so with you not being around, uh, what types of daddy issues do you feel that your children have? Do I feel that they have. I feel that I've been talked about badly, uh, mm-hmm. bad mouth, and I've I've gone above and beyond to clean that night. Okay. But it's nothing I can do if the main person they're with is constantly feeding that to them. Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, I can call, I can call, I can check on them, I can send them money or whatever, but it's still not going to compensate that I'm not there. So defend myself to let them see like this is what life is, is on my side too. So, okay. do you feel that they maybe have abandonment issues or uh, more of a resentment uh, to you? They don't have, they have, my oldest daughter has a resentment to me because she's jealous of my two younger kids. Okay. But I had to make her, I tried my best to make her understand that I'm, just like when I I was with you, I have to be with them too when I was with their moms. Hmm. And I always included the two, my all my kids together. I always included them all together. Hmm. And whoever I was with never, never singled them out. They always said, all right, well, you're a package deal. I'm with you and with your kids. Mm-hmm. So they never, so right now it was like, but it was always, like I said, it was always the other side with my mom talking about, oh, I don't care about them or it's just like, oh, he's going to spend his weekend with his other two kids, so do things like that. Mm-hmm. 
and that would that feed into it. If I can't come be with them because I got to work or I'm working overtime, but either way, like I said, I always told them, I said, if I don't work, you don't get nothing from me. Mm-hmm. And when I try to give you time, if I don't have the time, if I make this time for you, you tell me you got something else you want to do, oh, I try. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, I that's the weird hard, thing. If I go hard, I can either push you away or you can see that I'm going hard to do it for you. So that's the that's sometimes the weird balance is you know you want to provide everything you can for your family but you have to do things to provide for them you have to work you have to go out you have to make money but unfortunately right. at times our family the children or the wife they may become collateral damage exactly. because you have to provide for them and it's it's so unfortunate you know it's it's not that you don't love them but you love them so much that you're willing to sacrifice your time with them to make sure that they're all right but the flip side of that is that those turn into issues later on exactly. and you can't get that time back you know exactly. I, I think that it was very important that we had you on to discuss the other side of it because normally when people discuss daddy it's they only talk about oh my dad is so terrible my dad didn't care about me my dad didn't want to do anything to help me but people sometimes don't understand that you know maybe the dad had issues as in Derek's case or maybe the dad's busy or in your case trying to provide or Maybe they have an angry wife or angry mother or what have you. So, you know, I would definitely encourage the children to reach out to their dad if possible. It's not always possible because some dads are just, they're emotionally unavailable. They may be violent. They may be aggressive. They may not be good person. They may be hurt or damaged people themselves. And it's unfortunate, but what we need to do is we need to figure out how to move forward from these daddy issues. You know, it's important for us to come on and talk about it. And with today's episode, it's going to be a little bit different because the guests aren't going to speak as long. Because I'm going to allow us to speak to each other during this episode. And hopefully we can come up with a solution by the time this episode is over on how to get through these daddy issues or in certain cases, mommy issues. Uh, so before I open it up for our conversation, I want to go to Latia. Where are you? I'm right here. Hi, Latia. How are you? I'm good. 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 Well, Latia, she's our resident expert for the night. Uh, uh, Latia is a, can you uh, recite your, your full title because it's really long? I am a licensed clinical mental health counselor. Okay. Now, from your purview, what do you consider to be daddy issues? Um, so daddy issues are very complex. Okay. Um, just being a mental health therapist, a lot of people come into therapy with just the symptoms okay. of like anxiety and depression, right? Okay. But it stems from maybe daddy issues. It may okay. stem from abandonment issue, issues um, or like attachment issues or different things like that. Um, but nine times out of 10, it comes from a daddy issue and those daddy issues can look differently. And you kind of explained those already, like mm-hmm. being emotionally unavailable, um, the death of a parent or death of the father, um, the father just spending too much time at work, but he's still present or physically in the home. Um, a father that may be using drugs or substances and is not there so it looks different and I just want to make the connection of of generational curses from what we were talking about last week from your segment it connects to one another um because even I kid you not I I've counseled a lot of women and this is something that comes up every time Every time about either the, the father has sexually abused them or emotionally or mentally abused them. Um, and it's, it's a topic that we don't really get to talk about because it's so heavy and there's never like a solution to the problem because the cycle either continues mm-hmm. or we try to avoid it at all costs. So yeah, did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> you did. You did. Now, the symptoms that you listed as daddy issues, are there any others uh, that you didn't cover? 
that you think would qualify as daddy issue type symptoms? Um, like I said, it's complex. Sometimes it's just being emotionally detached, mm -hmm. not able to form or keep relationships, mm -hmm. um, not having healthy boundaries, anger, um, being incarcerated multiple times, um, not being able to finish school, like having poor school performance, like it's, it's so complex. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard to even like hone on what the issue is because it might be just daddy issues, but it might be something completely different as well, like work related issues. Mm -hmm. So, so addressing the daddy issues, it, it, it helps with the healing process because if you don't, you know, move past what has happened to you in the past, or if you haven't gotten past the, the fact that your daddy hasn't been there for you, or you have a per perception that your daddy hasn't been there for you, mm -hmm. it's hard to develop healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to even know your worth yeah. at times. Yeah. Now, I can see a few faces on the screen. How many of you think that you have some of those symptoms? Uh, that Latia described. Okay, we've got one, two. All right, okay. Now, you said that some of your patients come in and they have those types of daddy issues. What percentage do you think have them? What percentage of the, your patients' issues do you think stem from those daddy issues? I would say like from 90 to 95%. <laughs> And sometimes they're not even coming into therapy with that on their brain. It just comes mm -hmm. out while we're processing. They're like, oh my gosh, well, you know, my dad touched me when I was a, a child. I thought I got over it. No, mm -hmm. you probably suppressed it, probably thought that you got over it, but it comes out in other ways. It comes out with you drinking heavenly or comes out with, with you being angry at your spouse being resentful towards people like it comes out in different ways your relationship okay. with your parents mm -hmm. is the first relationship that you are learning how to to communicate and learning how to express your emotions with people so if you're having attachment issues it's gonna come out later on in life so would it be safe to say that there's a lot of people that have daddy issues or parental issues that don't know that they have them Absolutely. Absolutely. So that kind of ties back to episode two, when we talked about mental health. You know, it, it doesn't hurt you to get a mental health checkup because you could have those issues and you don't know how it's affecting you. Right. Now, what type of advice uh, would you give to someone that is experiencing daddy issues? Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, like being able to talk to someone who's going to be un unbiased sure. and who can really support you in a process of healing. Mm -hmm. um, Cause forgiveness is very key to the whole healing process. If you haven't gotten to the point where you can forgive and not holding on to the resentment, it's going to be hard for you to develop any type of healthy relationship. And that's, that's being, being modest. So being able to talk to someone, whether that's a mental health professional or someone mm -hmm. maybe from like their church or something like that, mm -hmm. getting it out and having support, having the resources around you, like even mm -hmm. for our children, like a lot of them don't even understand the dynamics of their family and how it affects them mm -hmm. on a personal level. So having like mental health integrated in after school programs or even at school can help them to have that outlet so they can be able to talk to someone um, that can kind of show them like their worth mm -hmm. and how they can mend the relationship that they do have already. Mm -hmm. It's weird it, how many of these subjects that we just covered on the show not just this episode, but previous episodes, how they all tie back to generational curses and mental health. Mm -hmm. it, it's so weird that Black people in general still have this stigma about mental health. It's still there. You know, yeah. 
one of the things that I would recommend is, as I said earlier, get yourself a mental health checkup. Just go to a therapist and just go talk to them because you could have these issues and not know that you have these types of issues. Now, I'm not sure if you yourself had daddy issues. Uh, you don't have to answer, <laughs> but if you did, do you feel that it helps you with speaking to patients that have had it? Absolutely. Um, and I, I'm not going to go too in depth with it. Sure, sure. But mine is, is generational. Oh, wow. As well as, in, it's, it's indirect, indirectly. Because my mom, she was molested by her grandfather. So that right there was a daddy issue. Yeah. And then my father wasn't in my life growing up because my mm -hmm. mom wanted to protect me. So we didn't have a close relationship with each other. Sure. So I participated in activities that I wasn't supposed to be participating in, you know, being promiscuous and um, getting into abusive relationships, not mm -hmm. being able to keep healthy relationships, um, not knowing my worth, like all of these layers because mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. not knowing that it, it relates to one another. Okay. But me going through school and getting the knowledge that I have now I'm able to kind of help other people who may be on the same journey of trying to, you know, heal from it because it affects you. It affects you whether or not your father is in the home or not in the home. And I it think affects that's a, you in different ways. And I think that's the thing that people sometimes forget. People assume that if you have a daddy issue, it's because your dad wasn't there. Mm -hmm. At times having your dad there can be worse. Right. You know, having your dad, you can have an emotionally unavailable dad. You can have a dad that's emotionally abusive that can affect you the same way. So daddy issues can affect you so many different ways. Right. I have a good, I have two friends of mine. Their father is an alcoholic. He, their father would rather be drunk than spend time with their children. I've been in situations where grown men tried to fight their son. Well, this person's son. And he was more interested in going to get a drink. So both of their sons have gotten into relationships that they can't maintain because their father never taught them how to maintain relationships. Their father right. never taught them that loyalty. You know, think about it. As soon as they got into a situation where their father should have been there, they left. And the both of them got into relationships and every time that their spouses needed them, they left. And they both have terrible relationships with their children because that's what they were taught by their father. So, you know, if you don't have a father in your life, try to get an uncle. You know, I was fortunate, you know, again, I had my dad, my dad had uncles around. So, you know, for those that have those daddy issues, try to get another positive male influence in your life. And a positive male influence isn't always someone who just compliments you and tells you that you look nice or just spends money on you or uses your body. It, it's more than that. You need someone that actually has the best intentions for you. Don't wait until you're 30 and then say, oh, I didn't get a dad, so I'm going to get me an aggressive man that's going to, you know, keep me in line. And, you know, that's unhealthy. It, it's really unhealthy. I know that Joe, uh, Joseph Hoke, who's actually on here, he has a, a relationship show. And a lot of the issues that come up are from people that have daddy issues. You know, mm -hmm. when you have those, it's difficult to maintain a strong relationship. Both ways. It's hard for men as well. If men have daddy issues, they don't know how to maintain a relationship. They don't know how to emotionally express themselves. That's another thing. So, you know, definitely, definitely get help. So again, we're going to change the format up a little bit this week. I'm going to open it up for questions early. Questions and answer Q&A, questions, comments. Uh, for those of you that are new to the show, if you have a question or comment, you can type it in the chat. Uh, you can raise your hands. If you're not sure how to raise your hands, if you look on your screen, there's three dots and it says more. If you click the more button, uh, there's, there should be an option to raise your hands. If none of those work, you can just uh, take your mic off and uh, say something and not acknowledge it. So does anyone have a first question or comments? My uh, raise your hand isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to thank both of y'all brothers, man, for uh, opening up and being so open and honest as you were. Uh, we rarely get to hear 
guys express about uh, daddy issues. So, so I definitely want to thank y'all about that. Is, is there any advice that either of you have given? would have for somebody who's experiencing daddy issues uh, from both of your perspectives is coming from the opposite ends, but I would just be interested to see if you had any advice from you. You want to go first, Damien? Or? Oh, you go ahead first. You go first, Derek. Okay, no problem. <laughs> uh, for me, uh, especially if their father isn't in a home or being with him can be kind of problematic, uh, the best thing I can say is, I said it a little bit earlier, was um. It's okay to love somebody from a distance if it means maintaining your sanity. So if you can't have a strong relationship now, then it's best just to keep your distance and just love them from a distance. Right. Yeah, that's the best thing I can say. Um, I think my on my end, uh, surrounding myself with positive people. I had, like I said, I had my stepdad, the stepmom, and my grandfathers. They um made sure they never talk bad about my father. Um, they made me make sure that I didn't make the same mistakes he made. So it was just like, if they saw me veering off to a certain way, then it was like, really you back in, hey, you're doing it wrong. This was, And then my grandfather was normally like, all right, what do you want to do? You want to become your father or you want to become yourself? And then my grandfather, we back it up, was like, are you a leader or a follower? So with that, I would just say, if you have like somebody that's bitter or something that's towards you and you have a kid with them, well, you got to deal with that, but be there for the kid no matter what. And basically know your laws of your state because that comes in handy when things go left or right, either which way, if you're in the right, the, the system is not made for us, it's made for the mother most of the times. But when it does turn this coin towards us, it's, it's best that we know every aspect of it so, so we can cover ourselves. All right, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I got a couple of text questions. Do we have any other questions or comments uh, before I get to those? I'm sorry, we switch screens. No? Okay. All right. I grab my phone, sorry. <laughs> uh, text question number one. It's actually for you, Damien. If your child were to come to you right now, the, the two children that, uh, that have the issue with you, and they were to say to you that they want literally no contact with you. And when they get married, they don't want you to walk them down the aisle or want them to be in your grand, eventual grandchildren's lives. How do you handle that? Well, I can say like this. Um, if that happens, then what can I do? I try. I, I put my best foot forward. If they don't want me there, I can't, I'm not going to force myself. I mean, I'll be there still. I'm still their dad. So the father is no matter what, I'll still be there, but I'm not going to go if they're out of respect. But it depends if they get to that point, then what can I do? I've tried, I've been my best foot forward. I just have to move on with life and I'll let things, let things uh, handle themselves. But I've always been, I've always been taught and I've always seen that as an adult, even as an adult and a child myself, you always end up finding a way back to your parents, no matter what. Yeah. So you can always yeah. sit up here and say, oh, I don't need them, just that and other. No, you're going to end up needing them because at the end of the day, it's always either your mom or your dad you got to go to. Yeah. So like I always, like, I proved that approach already with my oldest daughter. I didn't I let her have, her have her space for like two years. And then guess what? Junior, she called me and said, Dad, I want you to have my prom. I want you there for my graduation. I didn't say nothing to her for two years. I just got a call, kept going with her brother, kept going with her mom. And I was like, that's it. She don't want to talk to me. I can't force her. Like, that's it. I love you, brother. Hang on one second. Hang on, we got somebody else's phone on. If you're not asking a question, can you please mute your phone? I'm not sure whose phone that is. Uh, All right, I think that I fixed it. All right. <laughs> uh, any other questions, comments? No. Okay. 
because I'm going to keep going with the text messages. Uh, I have a question, James. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, for Damien and Derek, how has that played, or anyone else, um, how has that played on your self-confidence as you develop into your manhood and your relationships? Has that affected your confidence in yourself or um, in your relationships? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, even growing up, I mean, I, had, I got to this point where I was like, am I going to be a good guy when I get older? Mm -hmm. That was my biggest fear growing up. I was like, I don't want to be a drug addict. I, I don't want to be my father. So growing up, I was so self-conscious. I'm like, I got to be a good kid. I got to do this, got to do that. I don't never need to do drugs, nothing like that. I don't ever want to be like him. And so, and that lasted for a very long time, even a little bit to this day. Like I'm still feeling the effects. Like I still want to be a good kid. Even though I am, I still have that fear. Like I don't want to be like my father or my brother. I want to be better than them. Generational mm -hmm. curses are scary. Yeah, pretty much. Um, sitting over here, my what made me better it was the fact that I think I actually talked to my father. I thanked him for not being there because it let me have a space to see what a real man could do with my stepfather, my grandfather's, my uncles. Even with my mom, it, it let me see what what real people would do for their kids. And like even when. Like he'll pop up. I'll be like, all right, I'll, I'll chill with you. But my whole thing was every time we chill, I end up at my grandmother's house just sitting there. And he'd go about his business. But yet, and still, I understood at that time when I turned teenager, I started understanding a lot more. I'm like, all right, this is who you are. So I was like, I would never be like that. And I didn't. Know. So it was like my whole, my whole thing, I, I, when I turned about 30. I, Pull him aside and talk to him and say, you know, I thank you for not being here. It showed me that I needed to. Spencer, does that answer okay. your question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kamina, those prayer hands, a hand clap or a question? I can't tell which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a comment. Okay. <laughs> um. Right. So I just want to like hype up mental health and give y'all like a testimony type thing. So like I've dealt with daddy issues since I was eight or before then. That's when my parents divorced or whatever. And like going through counseling, it has really like allowed me to pinpoint what areas um, my father wasn't there for me and what things um, that hurt me. So like I, I think about two months ago, I had a conversation about like some things that happened when my father was supposed to be there watching me. I'm not going to go into detail, but like just our connection and me being able to talk to him, I was like one freaked out because like sometimes people can get defensive about their past. So my dad, he's like an alcoholic, but he does not want to admit it, guys. But just like hearing from my mom and just like the behaviors he is, right? Um, so just how that affected me, I was able to like have that conversation with him. And like, I remember telling my dad, like, it's okay. Like, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, I just felt like he chose alcohol and other stuff over me. But in the mm -hmm. same breath, he's like, I love you. I love you so much. I love all my kids so much. And then, like, I'm also realizing that things that happened in my childhood affected me, my brother, and sister. So it wasn't wow. just, like, me who had, like, this mental thing going on. It was, like, other people mm -hmm. in my family, too. Um but just that forgiveness piece is so like amazing. And like right now I'm like rebuilding my relationship with my father and like we'll talk, find different things to connect us and also setting those boundaries, right? Uh, because like literally I don't like when he drinks a lot around me because that just triggers bad things that happened when he was drinking. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I would just encourage like people to take advantage of therapy Sometimes your jobs may have like EAP, which mm -hmm. is like employee assistant program. Mm -hmm. And that will literally help your life. And like um, the Tia mentioned, I hope I said that right. It's a lot that falls down to the daddy issues. If you get, thank, if you get to the root of it, right? Um, and it's hard work. 
Like, I don't want to think about those uncomfortable moments that happen with my father. Nobody does. But it's necessary to your growth, you know? Um, so, yes. Do that mental health checkup, like you said, James. Yes. Absolutely, girl. Yes. <laughs> They're so important. Uh, I have a question for Derek. Uh, but before I get to Derek's question, I'm going to read something. Uh, I'm going to read, there's a, I was online and I was trying to figure out how I was going to explain uh, daddy issues. It's, you know, it's hard to explain because, you know, you may not realize that you have them as we've uh, realized, as we've spoken about. So I'm going to read through 15 signs uh, that I read online. And again, just because your father was in your life or mother doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't have these effects. So as I read them, you know, you can raise your hand, you can, you know, claim it, you can blink your eye, you can ignore it or just take it in. But I'm going to read these signs. Uh, one, uh, your self-esteem is low. You don't love yourself and you can't ever seem to, seem to implement boundaries because you always feel guilty for doing so. You have a really hard time trusting anyone that you're with. You usually have to spring them. You need validation from the other sex. If you're dating someone, you have this thing where you have to make it known that you're dating them or that you're in demand. Breakups aren't just devastating, they're catastrophic. They cause a lot of collateral damage uh, and you find yourself needing to seek validation. You like eliciting jealousy and other reactions that display the effect that you have on the opposite sex or same sex. Uh, uh, so far, can any of you, do any of you feel that you have any of those symptoms? And this is just so far. No? Uh, just the trust. I'm sorry? The, the one about trust. The or trust. having to screen people. I do that mm -hmm. heavily. <laughs> <laughs> like, I keep my circle real tight because I don't trust a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have trust issues too. I'm getting better though. Like they're <laughs> not anymore. And then like I'm still working on my self esteem and all of that. Um, but yeah. Um, congratulations, yes. Kamina. Um, yeah, my trust work. My trust issues is getting worse. So I might need some uh, <laughs> advice from you. But otherwise, <laughs> uh, self-esteem issues back in the day. Hey, good, hey, good evening, everybody, by the way. I know I'm just kind of popping in here. <laughs> um, trust issues. What was some of the other ones? I heard a few. Then I heard a few that didn't really, like, you know what I'm saying, connect. But, uh, low self-esteem. Um, uh, you don't love yourself. Uh, you have a hard time trusting anyone that you're with. Yeah, um, <laughs> at, at certain points, yeah, uh, looks need, like that was true. Uh, needing validation? <clears throat> from certain people, so it wasn't from everybody. I've never been that type to follow the leader type of thing. Sure, but for sure. certain people that you respect or maybe you have strong feelings for, yes. Uh, breakups are very difficult. Depending on how long we were together and what we break up over. Uh, it's hard for you to remain single. And again, this is for everybody. It hasn't uh, been hard at all, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in one way or another, you were emotionally orphaned as a kid by your parent or by a significant uh, parental figure in your childhood, and you've been in emotional driftwood ever since. Orphan oh, yeah. of doom. Next one. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Your parent was around but never really present. You never felt good enough to connect to your parent. Okay, see, that's the one that threw me off. So let me break this down for y'all if y'all don't mind, right? Sure, sure. So, and it's funny because, like I said, right now I'm with my nephew, you know, whatever the case may be. So mm -hmm. as far as, like, my father goes, so I bear the name of, I'm the junior, I, technically I'm the third, but that's another sure. story for another show. Mm -hmm. um, you hear all these great stories from my siblings that's older because the first set of siblings, they're 20 years older I was the makeup baby. <laughs> and then I guess my younger brother was the follow-up baby, and there was no more babies. But um, I have some other, like, half-brothers and sisters, you know, elsewhere. Um, 
my father used to work a lot. I think that's where I get my my workhorse mentality from. He he will be on the, he was a truck driver. So, you know, they're on the road 24-7. He stopped in, he traveled across country. I'm sure he traveled out of country if it was able to get to whatever the case may be. So, you know, now the type of relationship him and my mother had, my mother did not trust him. So, which probably sounds weird. I don't know. Once again, that's a, I don't want to be too long on it. But um, so therefore, a lot of things that my father would want to do with me and my youngest brother, it would be an argument with my mother. So I never really got to hung, hang you know, with him or whatever as much as I would like to be. Now, my youngest mm-hmm. brother would be out there with him. And my nephews, mm-hmm. like they all talk about Pop. That's, that's what we call them in the family. They all talk about Pop as if that's their father. Mm-hmm. So the funny thing about that with that question is I don't I don't have no ill will towards the man. Um, you know, they I wish we would have spent more time together. We have a lot of similarities together. Um, but you know, at the same time I can't say I have this strong, like deep connection and this, that, whatever, because we never did. You know, once I got old enough to get out and about, I was out working and doing whatever. So we mm-hmm. never really had that type of you want to say close bond. And some people don't understand this because you don't have that close bond doesn't mean that you have to hate somebody. Oh, why wasn't you around? No, some things get a little bit more complicated. Well, that actually ties into the uh, next uh, sign. You have abandonment issues due to emotional or physical abandonment from your parent. Mm -hmm. I see a couple of heads nodding on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a couple of heads nodding. Sort of. I mean, for me, I mean, not some, yeah, sort of. I, I'll say no, not for my father, because, you know, I just, when I, I immediately made him like odd man out, he was never even part of the picture. Mine came from my mom. Mm. Yeah. The last one is you consistently involve yourself with emotionally unavailable or not narcissistic spouses. Mm-hmm. Or Somebody, oh, I got to wait. What, what, what was the end of that? <laughs> wait, wait, say it one more time, please. Uh, you consistently <laughs> involve yourself with emotionally unavailable or narcissistic spouses or partners. So do you mean like you're, you're, you're messing around with married people? Is that what that means? Or No, no, no. Emotionally unavailable. Like they're not the emotional types. They're not the type to show you that the love. You know, they're, oh, they're hell selfish. No, no, they're arrogant. No, no, no. Right. Like, um, no, they're the enemy. They're the enemy. No, I don't know. I can't stand an arrogant woman. I love a woman that's proud of herself. Arrogant? Ah, oh, bro, you done been there. So you done see plenty of examples. Oh, hell no. Nah, you can, don't check me off on that one. <laughs> but some people do that. Certain people, they think that's love. You know, yeah. I, I had an ex and we broke up because I wouldn't hit her. She cheated on me because I would not put my hands on her. That was her daddy issue. I guess that her father was emotional to her mother, well, I'm sorry, was abusive to her mother. So she thought that that was a sign of love was for a man to put her hands on you. So my thing was, I'm not, I'm not hitting you. I'm not putting my hands on you. So the guy that she cheated on me would beat, her, beat on her for about three years, got her pregnant, and then threw her down the steps so that she would lose the baby. The next guy that she was with beat on her. The guy after that literally beat her out of her apartment. He literally hit her so hard, she flew onto the fire escape. We reconnected some years later, just as friends. And I started to speak to members of her family that I was close to, and they said that that's, her mom was the same way. She wound up getting pregnant. The guy that she was with was abusive. That guy left her while she was pregnant. The guy after that, abusive. And all of that ties back to the fact that her father was abusive to her mother, but her father was also very loving to her mother. So she tied the two together. That if someone loves you, they're willing to put their hands on you. Mm. So you right, know, well, the that, education that we have that that all comes from home. So a lot yeah. of things that we don't like, a lot of traits of these people walking around to do. Guess where that starts at? That starts yeah. from home. Mm-hmm. Whether yeah. it's examples being shown there or the lack of examples, because there's nobody being around. So that makes perfect sense. And some of us that's growing up, thank God, I really didn't. But other people having abusive homes. But father just walks in and, you know, does whatever. And, hey, in this day and era, sometimes it's reversed. You know, and sometimes it's the yeah. mother that come in and trying to fight the father, whatever. Regardless, a little yeah. child has no idea of what's going on. So they're just trying to yeah. absorb 
what their leaders and their teachers right now of life is supposed to be doing. So if if daddy walks in and and chokes mommy, okay, a little child says, okay, I guess that's where it's supposed to be when um, you know, I don't get along with whoever, whatever the case may be. Um, and you know, they go, you know, and especially like I said, when you're young, you're absorbing a lot of that. So as you go through life, um, if you're not pulled to the side or educated differently, you think that that's cool. And unfortunately, sometimes with those that, that are victims of, of watching that and that type of environment, they run into other ones that are victims as well. So those victims think it's cool to be choked and the other victim mm. thinks it's cool to choke her. You know what I'm saying? Whenever th those type of situations evolve. Mm. And look how those normally end. Mm. Um, and a lot of times it's too late. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, before we skip ahead, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead, Spencer, I'm sorry. What, what's the clinical definition of narcissistic behavior? This is why I'm so happy to have a resident expert here. Uh, Latia, are you able to give a definition of that? Um, so a narcissistic person or a narcissistic behavior is someone who may be like arrogant, um, wants to receive validation from other people. They have a difficult time showing any type of empathy. Mm -hmm. Um, they have issues with, they may, they may have issues with drugs or alcohol, but it's, it's hard for them to, to form and keep and maintain relationships or even develop strong bonds with people. Um, I'm trying to think what else for narcissistic. Yeah. Do you think it's developed or is it generational? or a learned behavior? It's all of the above, mm -hmm. to be honest. It's, yeah, it's, it's complex. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just like, because I've dealt with that personally. Um, like, I'm not trying to get too personal, but... Um, <laughs> Get it off your chest. Go ahead. I get it. I get it. <laughs> no, I think um, the process, because a lot of people are very, even in the mental health com and community, we try to stay away from that. The personality disorders, especially narcissistic, because they're difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. Because in their mind, they're right. They're mm -hmm. correct. It takes some time breaking down those barriers and breaking down those negative thoughts mm -hmm. that or, or negative beliefs that they have about themselves because they're very arrogant. <laughs> so it, it, takes a, it takes a person to really truly look themselves in the mirror and be like, okay, I need to change. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question you asked, with. James, I guess that would be uh, somewhat of a yes then with that behavior pattern that Latia just described mm -hmm. in reference to relating to some people. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm attracted to that, but I have had um, people that I know that have okay. tendencies that Latia just described on a consistent basis. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking maybe we have all had someone like that to some degree. Sure. But you know, and there's a thin line, Latia, between confident and arrogance. So how do you uh, differentiate that? Um, or is that like just a be, cliche? Majority of the time, it's just a facade. Like, they're yeah. putting up a front because they don't want you to get in, in deep of whatever's happened to them. Because usually it stems from maybe a traumatic experience or how they were raised in, in, in their environment. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think there's a thin line between arrogant and being confident. Like, you know, when a person is confident, a person is arrogant when they're trying to take all the validation, they're trying to take all of the admiration. Like they get jealous when another person succeeds, it succeeds and they're not succeeding themselves. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's different. It's like that cocky person that, puts you down when everybody else wants to be, you know, brought up, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And they're very manipulative as well. Can't forget that. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I'm sorry, Spencer, does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, I did get a message sent to me for Derek. Uh, with the relationship that you've had with your father, if mm -hmm. he, let's just say one day, changes his ways, stops doing drugs, becomes a different person, and we're talking years down the line, and you have children, and he wants to be in your children's life, do you allow him to be in your children's lives or do you just kind of say you know what yeah you don't have a grandfather yeah that's gonna be a no for me um i would just have to say that he will know of them and they will know of him okay but in regards to a relationship i don't want to make that mistake now um, what if they want one what if they want it yes i would have to tell them no and i'll tell them why even at a young age i'll explain to them in their way of why mm -hmm. they can't have a relationship with them. Okay. Yeah. Not not to be malicious or anything. It's just you've shown that you had issues with kids, and I there's a deeper story, but I haven't gotten into it, and I'm not going to. Sure. Um, but yeah, I just I'll explain to my kids like, even though he might have a good heart, he has a lot of issues that he needs like full on therapy to get handled, and until that time comes. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell them the story of him. They'll know of him, but in regards to meeting him, absolutely not. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments? I just have a comment about how important boundaries are. Because even when I had that conversation with my father about alcoholism, I said, what happened to me and my brother and sister will not happen with my kids. Like, mm -hmm. if he starts drinking too much, we're leaving. Like, end of story, you know? Um, because, like, I don't want what I had for my children. And boundaries are okay. They're part of, like, healthy relationships. So, yeah, setting boundaries is pretty good. Yeah. Now, for those of you, well, before I get to my next part, does anyone have any other questions or comments? Why well, is the quiet group? <laughs> uh, okay, I have a question for everybody. Okay. So, picture yourself as a second grader, right? Mm -hmm. For <laughs> kids who begin experiencing daddy issues, what advice would you give your second grade self? Or what advice would you give teachers who want to help the children during this time? Because as I think Legend mentioned, like these daddy issues come out in a lot of different ways, especially in the classroom. So like, mm -hmm. what advice would you give your second grade self? And what advice would you give a teacher who is teaching? Uh, do I start? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, the advice that I would give them is if they have these types of issues, try to confide in your parents. Uh, try to confide in your other relatives that you trust, which is kind of hard, especially for a second grader to kind of decipher who they can and can't trust. But try to get that help from the family because you don't want that feeling of loneliness. And that, that's something that can turn into a problem later on. If these kids feel lonely or helpless, if, you, if a child learns that at an early age, that's going to go with them for the rest of their lives. And if that happens, they may fall in with that wrong, with that bad group because they're seeking that validation. They're seeking someone to take that loneliness away from them. I'm going to tell a really short story. I'm going to let everybody go about a good friend of mine. He, uh, his mom was on drugs his entire life, well, most, the ninety percent of his life, and his father was in prison, in and out of prison. So. He sought that validation from his parents, but he couldn't get it because again, his mom was an addict, his dad was in prison. So his entire life, he would hang out with gangs because that was the image of what family was to him. He hung out with his cousin because his cousin was a gang member 
and they all hung out in the house as gangs. I think that had he found a way to get that validation from maybe another group or another relative, he may not have sought that out. Because years now, he's 36 now, he's now been to prison multiple times because of these gangs. He's, he has six children by five different women because he's still seeking that validation. Yes, she told me that he wants to have four more children. Because again, he's seeking validation because now he can say, look at what I have. Look at what I built. Now see how important I am. I'm a dad. Because he never got that validation as a child. So, you know, try to get that validation from a relative. Try to get therapy. That mental health treatment is very, very important. You know, I, I can't advocate for mental health treatment enough. So that's kind of my two cents. I don't know who wants to go next. I'll go next. Sure. Um, because I personally have have dealt with this. Okay. Um, and even even as a child, I remember where I was like maybe like eight, nine years old. I questioned the fact that my father wasn't in my life. I, I would ask a lot of questions. I was very intuitive, but I never received the answers of why my father wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know the dynamics of, of the family and what happened to my mom growing up, not until later on in life. Mm -hmm. um, so for, for me, talking to my second grade self, I would tell her that I'm worthy, that I'm, I was brought here. I would say, even though my father isn't here, my biological father isn't here, Spiritually, my father is with me and he never leaves me nor forsakes me. Mm. And I would instill that in me and, and know that I always have an outlet to express my emotions, whether that is through writing, through being creative, through dancing, through singing, through cooking, through whatever it is, being able to kind of place that in there because I, I was angry, extremely angry. I would go from zero to a hundred, like real quick. Mm -hmm. um, but, but learning empathy, knowing how to say it's, it's okay to not be okay with the fact that I don't have my father there or, or anyone who may be having father issues or even mother issues. It's okay, but it doesn't have to end with that. It's not a, a means to an end, like things can change. I don't have to carry that weight with me. So that's what I would say to my second grade self. Mm. And for you being a teacher, being supportive, that, that helps out a whole lot because these kids, they're going to remember your name. Just like I said, like the, the relationship that these kids are forming, the first relationship that they know is their parents the second or third are the teachers they remember you guys like I was a, a, a camp counselor and my name is Miss Giggles I still have <laughs> kids that come up to me that even find me on Facebook and that's what they know me as so you y'all are being very influential in your child in the child's life just be supportive be a listening ear and and let them know that they are loved despite whatever environment that they're in. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll go. So I'll, oh, oh, okay. Go. You can go, Legend. You first. And okay. and great great job, Latia. Like I love that right there. You got it, Damien. <laughs> it's Derek, I think. I think Derek is going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that no, was Derek cool. that said that because I see. My bad, Derek. You got no, you cool. Bro. You cool. No, um, you got it, brother. Yeah. I would say to my second grade self, not everybody's a bad guy. You can trust some people. That's one of the biggest things I tell my second grade self. Because like I said, when I was a kid, I ain't trust nobody. Nobody. Family, friends, didn't matter. I don't trust you. I don't know you. I don't trust you. So that's a, some advice I would definitely give myself. Um, but to piggyback on what Latia said for you, Kamina, support, support the kids. That's the best way you know how it means the world 
to kids. I even think about when I was a kid, when I had teachers that supported me because they knew my family, they knew the dynamics and they were just always there for me just to talk and be like, well, you know, everything was gonna work out, this and that. Like even those little words of encouragement, they mean the world to them. So yeah, that's my little two cents. Thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, Rob or Legend? All right, so I think the most thing that I would um that I would tell my was second grade self is that I know there's a lot of things going on with you know around you right now in the household that you don't understand, and that's fine. You know you're you're too young to understand that you shouldn't even be you know under uh, seeing a lot that's going on but don't let it change you from what your future can be and all the potential that you have. Um, some of these family relatives that you see might not have the best for you. It might not be the best role models. So you be your own role model. And, um, and you also learn from those that surround you. They might not be direct siblings or what have you, but we grow up as brothers and sisters with uncles and nephews and nieces. And, um, and even with, um, you know, even with friends from school and things like that, you know, just try to soak in everything that you can learn because in the future you might, <laughs> you're probably not going to have any help from these ones that's of the next generation. There's nothing guaranteed. So, you know what I'm saying? At this particular time and date, soak up everything you could be and don't forget that you have a little brother coming right behind you and a little niece. So they're going to be looking up to me the way I look up to, like I said, all the other older, which I know sounds weird, but most of my nieces and nephews, they're older than me, not by much, but we all grew up around the same age. So, um, you know, look up to them, make sure that you got your point, your strong point on whenever we get to that age where it's time to get into real reality um, and um, hold your position and, um, Make the best of it. Just soak in all the good things around. Don't pay attention to any of this craziness going on around you, especially that you don't understand. You'll understand it later, but right now, live life, be a kid. I um, think that's it. Thanks, Rob. Is anybody else? No? Okay. It's cool. Thank y'all so much. I was here <laughs> taking notes. Like, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wait, wait, you got to say yes. Did I, say, did I learn how to say it right yet? Yes. I, yes. I'm never going to learn how to say it right <laughs> I'm never going to learn how to say it. I, I'm not. I, I've been trying. It's, it's not going to work. It, it's not going to work. <laughs> you got uh, it, though. I, I did? Yeah, you got it. It's Great. in I'm, your way. It, yeah, no. I'm, I'm never going to get good at it. <laughs> I have a certain limit. There's boundaries, like we talked about earlier. I'm not going past that boundary. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Concerns? Good to see you all. <laughs> Good to see you too. Uh, thank uh, you for hearing uh, my story. I'll say that. So. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate you all for just being on here, being open, being honest. You know, I know that there's certain people on here, th these stories may resonate more with people here than they're willing to admit to. And if you're not comfortable talking about it, that's all right. But hopefully you all took something from this. You all learned something from this. You know, even if it's not helping you, maybe you can use this to help someone else. That's definitely, uh, that's definitely the goal with this. The goal with this really is to try to heal each other and heal ourselves. Hopefully you have at least started to. Uh, again, I want to thank my guests. I want to thank Derek. I want to thank Damien. I want to thank my resident expert, Latia. By the way, Latia, that's going to be your new name, the resident expert, just, just to let you know. I'm with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, from the guests, I'm going to see if they have any uh, final comments. Uh, Derek? I'm pretty good. I mean, I'm you're good. good. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Damien? Uh, you got to turn your mic on. Your mic's off. <laughs> I haven't learned how to read lips yet. <laughs> <Who's this guy? laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm saying whatever you do, just stay strong, no matter what, for your, for your kids or yourself. Most likely, yeah. you, can, if you can't stay strong for yourself, you're not going to be strong for them. So, 
first of all, sometimes you got to be a little bit selfish that way. But you got to stay strong and just let things fold out for itself. Yeah. Uh, resident expert, Latia. Yeah, when, you, when he said um, <laughs> selfish, I was like, oh, that's a trait for narcissistic. Okay, <laughs> but that's where my mind goes. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I really do appreciate this segment right here because when I was growing up, I didn't have anyone to talk to about these things. Mm -hmm. I had to kind of deal with it the best way that I could, and I received the healing as time went on. But going through it, a lot of kids are not even going to be able to express it because they don't even understand what a daddy issue is. Just like it was hard for you to define it because yeah. it's so complex. It's other yeah. things that's going on. Yeah. And you can't really pinpoint it, not unless you're open to talk about it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I just urge everyone to get a therapist. <laughs> at this yes. point therapy yes. is life <laughs> I think that is the theme of this show is every episode ends with you know what will help you? Therapy, therapy. and uh, I know for me personally I I, uh, I went to therapy and it was, I started to see a real difference when I went to a black therapist not to say that white therapists can't help you but I went to a black therapist and they were able to kind of understand my plight a little bit more than my previous therapist but if you haven't gone to therapy give it a shot Seriously, give it mental health checkups. We do physical checkups all the time. We do them once a year, but how often do we check our minds? How often do we check our mentors? You know, we, a lot of us, we grew up in a household where if you're stressed out, we'll just pray it away. Right. You know, read your Bible. That's all well and good, but God puts therapists here. Right. What's your coping like, skills? Yeah. It's kind of like how you have that, that, that auntie that you could talk to about everybody, that you could talk to about everything. God might have put them here for you to talk to. So same thing with the therapist. You know, it, it's nothing wrong with getting therapy. And as Tia said, there's people who that have daddy or mommy issues that they don't know and they don't know that they have them. So get that mental health checkup. It, it can't hurt you. Uh, before I sign off, just to let you guys know, next week's show is going to be about surviving the criminal justice system. I don't know how many of you saw my Navigating the Criminal Justice System episode with uh, Ms. Kara. Have any of you seen it? Okay, first of all, anybody, did you all learn anything from that episode? Because I learned a lot. Uh, so what we're going to do with this one is we're going to do the flip side. We're going to talk to someone that has actually gone through the criminal, system, criminal justice system and going to prison. And they're going to explain what that's like, what it's like going through the system and the effects that it still has on them to this day. Uh, in the future, we, we're going to do an episode about mommy issues, and we're going to do one about fathers that are holding it down for their kids. Because I, one thing is I'm not going to continue this narrative that black fathers aren't there for their children. Because it's, it's not true. There mm -hmm. are some that aren't, there are some that may have emotional issues, but there's still a lot of black fathers that's holding it down. So we're definitely going to uh, be having that episode coming up. Uh, we do still have our Black Health episode coming up. And I'm going to start a challenge during that episode. And I'm uh, trying to get myself ready for it. <laughs> oh, God, it's going to be hard. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a challenge that I'm going to go through. Uh, and, you know, we have a lot of good things coming up. As always, if there's ever a topic that you want me to cover, let me know. There's nothing that is taboo. Trust me, it, um, we're gonna do an episode about transgenders in the black community. So that tells you there's nothing taboo. So, you know, if you have an, have, have an idea uh, for something that you want to discuss or, you know, you feel that I should look into, let me know. Because this show isn't only about me. This show is about helping all of you and everyone that watches. For those of you that are new to the show, every episode of the show is now on YouTube. So, you guys might want to write it down or I'll put it in the chat. If you go to Fall to Rise Pod, Fall to Rise Podcast on YouTube, I have, well, this one will be on tonight and I'll have uh, episodes one through six on YouTube. Uh, please feel free to subscribe. Uh, so whenever I do post a new video, you'll get the notification first. Uh, it, 
like I said, I have some pretty hard hitting topics coming up. Some of them are going to be very emotional. Uh, some of them are going to be very difficult to talk about, but they're coming. So I hope you all are ready for it. Uh, we're going to be doing one on education. So Kamina, I might need to tap. I mean, I might need to tap you for that one because you're into education. But yeah, we're going to do episodes about education. Again, we're going to do a lot of different things. So you know, stay tuned, stay involved. And before we sign out, does anyone have anything to plug? Any shows, any networks, any YouTubes, any companies? Does anyone have anything to plug? Uh, I have something if I may. There you go. Uh, Joe. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> uh, my, uh, our, our community, our ministry, uh, he said, she said, uh, there's some uh, people that's up here that's in that community. We have our uh, monthly topic. Uh, so what are we? Um, it's the name of the topic. Uh, that's on uh, August 15th uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. So um, I, I can be found on YouTube as well, Joseph O. Third. I can plug that definitely in the chat. I don't want you to mess that up. Uh, <laughs> check me in there. Um, I'm also on Facebook, my government name. Um, so just uh, look me up if you're interested in attending. I have a flyer that's on my page. But you have to inbox me for the Zoom password. So if you're interested in coming, we'd love to have y'all. Okay. Thank you, Josh. I have Thank something. You, okay. So you actually inspired me, James. And I uh -oh. made a podcast called Mina's <laughs> Motivations. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's on <laughs> Spotify. And I also have, like, a Facebook page. Okay. And a website. Um, oh, wow. and I can just add that to, I'll put it in the chat, but I'll also just send it to you. Okay. Um, but basically it talks everything from like social justice, random things I'm finding in the Bible. Cause it's crazy in that book. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but, um, and mm -hmm. like, just like my testimony. So I'm trying okay. to like, just become more vulnerable because I feel like my story could help a lot of people. Um, okay. But yes, yeah, it's called Mina's Motivations. M-I-N-A-S Motivations with the S at the end. But yeah, okay. check it out. It's new, but I'm telling you, like, God wants me to speak. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you. Does anyone have anything else to close? Well, while we're on the topic, first of all, Congratulations, Mina. I can't wait to hear your uh, podcast coming up. Um, basically, on Monday nights at 8 p.m., um, yours truly, along with Damien, a.k.a. Uh, DJ Just D, and our uh, host for tonight, James Jimmy Bones Brown. Um, we, along with James Icon Grant, we host a podcast called Extreme Truth Podcast, 8 p.m. We cover a lot of different topics. And from there, we're not trying to, let me just make sure you see I'm sincere. Yeah, so, you know what I mean? So, you know, we cover a lot of topics. We try to be sincere about it. You know, that's where the whole point of extreme truth is not something where we're trying to sugarcoat to be politically correct. Also, would be respectful. So uh, feel free to come through, Confess the X. That's Extreme Truth Podcast, Monday nights, 8 p.m. Feel free to join us. Thank y'all for being here. God bless. Good night. Well, what I'll do is I'll actually post the information. Uh for these shows online. Uh, I believe that everyone here does have me on Facebook. I, I do have a Fall to Rise Facebook page. It's under construction, but feel free to subscribe to Fall to Rise uh, pod on Facebook and uh, Fall to Rise podcast on Instagram. Again, both pages are under construction, but uh, feel free to add me. Uh, everything should be updated this week. Uh, does anyone have anything else to plug? No? Let's see, you look like you're getting ready to say something. I don't know. Um, I was checking. Oh, this is so sidebar. But I was checking because I'm in the process of developing my own private practice. Okay. And I'm looking on the Secretary of State and I've been approved. So, yay. Your girl about to be on. Congrats. Her own. <laughs> congratulations. Thank so, you. congratulations. So, I. I see so your work. Yeah. <laughs> so we talked about Amen. the need for mental health and to show you how things work out. We now have our resident expert that will now be able to perform mental health treatments online. So yeah. 
is there a way that people can reach out to you or contact you? Um, yeah, I can um, put my stuff right here. Now, what about for people that are watching? Uh, the people that are watching? Yes, um, you can call me, actually. Or you can look me up on Psychology Today. My name is Latia Edwards, okay. L-A-T-I-A, Edwards, okay. E-D-W-A-R-D-S. Mm -hmm. um, or you can ca uh, call me or text me directly, 704-258-6679. Or you can email me, and it's latia.edwards, the number one, at gmail.com. Got it. Got it. All right. Yeah. Congratulations again. Thank you. Does anyone have hey. anything else to <laughs> Does anyone have anything else to plug? Any other questions, comments, or anything like that? No. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy that you were here. I'm happy that we were able to cover this subject. Hopefully some of you, hopefully the people that are watching this got something from this. You know, even if it doesn't affect you personally, maybe you can spread this information to someone else. At the end of the day, it's all about helping each other. That's kind of the goal with this show, Fall to Rise. We're here for conversation, not controversy. A lot of shows want controversy. I care nothing about that. We need to have conversations with each other so that we can talk to each other and so that we can heal each other. So I really thank you all for being here. Thank you for supporting this show as you have through seven episodes. I know that doesn't sound like much, but again, I didn't think that I would make it through episode one. <laughs> so uh, again, I, I really thank you. If you want to reach out to me with show ideas, questions, or comments, you can contact me at fall to rise pod at gmail.com or you can go to the youtube page which is fall to rise podcast feel free to subscribe and there's actually going to be a lot of exclusive content coming up soon. so for me james brown and the guests that have been on here tonight uh thank you and good night good night all right thank you guys yes good night everybody <laughs>